Welcome to the Six Ranch Podcast. On today's episode, I have Courtney Boyce and Derek Oltius. These guys travel all over the world fly fishing and filming fly fishing and helping other people learn how to have higher quality adventures with higher quality memories in their own fly fishing expeditions. Super interesting guys. I had the privilege of fishing with them once in the southernmost point in Argentina, Peninsula Mitra in uh, Tierra del Fuego. Great anglers, really fun to be around, and it was a pleasure having them on the show. Hope you enjoy it. So you guys just took a private jet to go fishing in Alaska? We sure did. I can tell you one thing. Yeah, tell me the one thing. It's way better than flying commercial. That's all I <laughs> What kind of snacks were available? I, I think just about anything that you could ever want. What wasn't available? I think it goes over like your brainwaves and like thinks of things that you love and it's just there. There was seriously so much stuff on there. Candy and popcorn, different chips, cookies. I mean, all sorts of little snacks like Nutter Butters, 50 different types of drinks. The guys ordered pizza for us. It was crazy. Well, you know, I I appreciate that you guys struggled through that so that you could make it up north <laughs> and fish a little bit. But here's what I want to talk about. The the success that that you guys have had through extremely hard work and a lot of suffering started where? Like where did where did fly fishing start for the two of you? Well, for me, fly fishing started uh up in montana where i am right now and i just loved fishing i grew up in a lake in montana always loved fishing was always obsessed with water i mean every time we drove anywhere my face was pressed against the glass looking for any type of water and wondering what type of fish was in there and when i was eight my uncle who worked as a commercial tire for an orvis store sent me out on the Gallatin River when we were visiting him in Bozeman. And uh, yeah, I just fell in love with fly fishing for Christmas that year. My dad got me a fly rod and I just been fly fishing ever since. That's really cool. Let me work on that one a little bit because lots of people learned how to fly fish when they were young and, and they, you know, tried to figure out how to tie a woolly bugger out of, you know, parts of their carpet and some <laughs> hair that they cut off their dog or whatever, you know, and went out and floundered around and eventually caught a fish and then continued to do it. Like that, that's the origin story for a lot of people. Yeah. But a lot of times that's, you know, more or less where it ends. You know, we refine a little bit. We start buying ties that are tied professionally, upgrade our gear somewhat, and then fish a few times a year and enjoy that, you know, as much as you can enjoy something that can be insanely frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it went a lot farther for you. And Court, your story is is somewhat different, right? So what was it for you? How did you get into it? Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Growing up, I, I didn't like fly fishing because I was super into kayaking. So I was always in the river. If I was in the river, I I just... I could never even imagine just stopping and like sitting on the shore and like casting a rod. I was always just looking for like a big wave to like go surf or, you know, some, some stuff like that. So every time my brother-in-law would go out fishing, he would try to get us to go. And I'd be like, uh, no, thanks though. If I'm never <laughs> in the water. I'll be in a kayak. So it wasn't till later. Like I love, I like to fish and stuff back then, but it just wasn't like, top priority. I, I was more into, you know, snowboarding and biking and kayaking and other stuff that like would destroy my body. So it wasn't until I got old, you know, 
and stuff when I started to kind of gravitate toward it. I just, and I, and at the time I didn't really know anyone that did it down this way in Utah. Um, so I just kind of started doing it. I didn't catch a fish for a long time. So I sucked. And, uh, but you know, yeah, same thing. Just I, once I get on something, I kind of get on it and I, and I can never really stop thinking about it. I obsess over it a little bit. And that's kind of what I did with, with fly fishing and kind of have, have ever since. Now, did you just kind of casually kayak and snowboard or, you know, what, what was that like? <clears throat> no, we always competed. So like we would be, you know, we would do kayak competitions where we do freestyle kayaking and where you go to like a specific uh, wave or, or feature on a river and you do like as many tricks as you can, you know, whatever, and kind of snowboarding and, and biking was all the same. We used to bike race and mountain bike race and uh, we climbed quite a bit back then too. And uh, I didn't compete tons in snowboarding. But we had a lot of sponsors, and I just told my sponsors because I didn't, I don't like to compete. I always just crack under pressure. But I just always told people, yep, I'll snowboard for you, for your company, but I'm not going to compete because that's not my, it's not my jam. And so usually guys would be cool with that. But yeah. And, and Derek, was Orvis the first company that you really started working with? Um, no, they weren't actually. We started working uh, as a film crew with several other companies, and then we were working with Loop USA, which uh, there's a guy, Shane Wooten, at Loop USA and and his whole staff, and they're all incredible. But as soon as Loop Corporate got involved, we didn't really see eye to eye on the vision of where we were going with films and things like that. And so at the time, I'd known the Orvis guys pretty well, and they had kind of been in discussion about having us work with them. And, and then we end up going over there. You know, it just was a really good fit with everything that the Orvis company stands for. It just kind of fit in with what we were seeing as well. Now, the, the thread that I'm kind of teasing at here is that everything that the two of you guys have done you've done to the point where you become professionals at it and, and not just professional, but you perform at the very highest level within that professional sector of the activity. And for the past, I don't know, 10 years, um, it's been film, filmmaking and fly fishing at least. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. And these cameras and fly rods and fish have carried you to a couple different locations. Uh, you want to talk me through some of the some of the places that you've got to go fish uh, th through this adventure? <laughs> well, yeah, a lot. It's been awesome. We've been super lucky to to travel to a lot of ultimate, you know, like bucket list places for fly fishing. Let's just list a couple, Derek. You just fill in here. Last year we we went to uh, Argentina. Uh, I mean, I don't know, Slovenia, Seychelles, Dubai, Seychelles, all over the United States and Canada. Yeah. Lots of Canada and Alaska trips. Um, we went down to Colombia, and we got to fish together in, in Tierra del Fuego on Peninsula Mitra. And that was about as far away as you could possibly get from where we live. It was a tremendous <laughs> trip <laughs> with lots of, uh, lots of adventures. Uh, some of which we could talk about and some of which we won't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We were just, we were just, Derek was just pointing that out when we were up in Alaska last week, he was pointing to the map on the plane. He's like, we were here and he pointed down to, you know, Tierra de Fuego and, and now we're here and like at the, opposite end of the world you know just the bottom part of the world as far south as you can go and then you know up to the the as far north as you can go so it's pretty cool to experience that stuff and it, it's one thing to kind of talk about 
just just places like oh these are just some places that i've been but when you talk about how difficult it actually is to achieve that travel and the logistical requirements of of going into these countries in these extremely remote places and it's not like you guys are just hanging out at swanky lodges and you know getting getting guided like you're you're out there hooking and jabbing in some really extreme environments like what you did in the arctic when you're after arctic char that was tough sledding by by anyone's standards that was a, a physically and mentally demanding trip um and you made a beautiful video about it but can you talk to me a little bit about that trip and like some of the things that you found and, and how difficult it was to turn up fish and then what happened once you actually found the fish Oh man. <laughs> so I guess we'll start at the very beginning of that, which is years prior to the trip that we took. I stumbled upon uh, some photos when I was a teenager of these beautiful Arctic char. And my mind kind of exploded that a fish could look like that. I mean, they were just so colored up so orange that they looked like a road cone. And so, you know, I kind of had held on to that. And years after that, my uncle was actually looking for a hunting territory to buy in Canada. And we were looking at a few different areas and I saw the same pictures um, being advertised for a hunting territory that was up for sale. It was a, a muskox hunting and caribou hunting operation that did Arctic char and lake trout. And so we, we started looking into that operation and finances didn't really work out. And we, you know, my uncle didn't move forward and actually buy the, the territory. But, you know, he started digging in deep in research to find out where these fish were, what lakes, what rivers, you know, how could we potentially catch them? And when we all as a group, Phil Tuttle, Court, myself, uh, started talking about what was a dream trip for us, we said Arctic char. And so we started researching more and more and more and figuring things out and you know, when we went up there, we thought, okay, we have, we've read hundreds of pages of research on these Arctic char. We have narrowed it down to these few lakes and we should be able to go there and just catch some fish. And when we arrived in Canada, oddly enough, we bumped into the biologist and the biologist kind of confirmed what we had thought. He was dumbstruck that these three guys had read all this, you know, old research on Arctic char. And, and he was almost giddy to see somebody else as nerdy as he was. <laughs> so, you know, he was really cool and talked to us about the different places and we got flown out and dropped off to these spots. And man, we just could not find an Arctic char to save our life. We were fishing hard every day. And I don't think we even saw an Arctic char like until our eighth day out there or something like that. After, you know, we, we'd walked around the lake a few times. We had walked up and down the river. We'd gone to another lake, you know, we were just hiking all over the tundra trying to find these things and finally we found these fish so it, it was definitely a lot of hard work and research that went into it but for me i think that's the trip what else did you find i remember the most <laughs> well Court, what did we find well you know we're, the area that we were in was really remote we were flown in after flying forever far far north and uh yeah, it was just along the, the shore, Phil spotted like a, a cool white rock. We're always looking for like little treasures to bring back. He found a white rock. So we picked it up and it ended up being a human skull, which was crazy. I mean, it 
really freaked a lot of people out and myself included. Yeah, Derek Derek didn't even I mean he just kept walking and never came back. But we thought it was cool. Found just kind of human remains and and uh it just makes you you know realize how real that place is up there. The weather's crazy and can get crazy, but they do have a lot of native populations that that were in the area, you know, historically. And so we contacted the authorities and let them know, you know, what we found. And they basically just said, leave, you know, if you find stuff like that, just leave it be. And uh, I don't even really think that they do anything about it. I think they just leave them where they are. So yeah, it's pretty crazy. You know, a, a lot of people with everything that's going on in the world right now are kind of struggling with how to balance the way they live their lives and the the threat of mortality. And, you know, we're, we have all this conflicting information about how dangerous it is or how dangerous it is not to go out in public and, and live your life and do things. And for months we were we were locked inside. But you have to really confront your own mortality sometimes when you see an artifact like that, when you, when you're out there living your life, like aggressively pursuing your dreams of, of finding these fish in this remote place. And then you come up against a human skull. It's like, wow, somebody died right here where I am. And this is all that's left of them. Not even a memory. This is it. But on the other side of it, you guys were, were risking a lot being there too. And that could have could have easily been you but the the reality is you were out there you know doing everything you could just to just to be alive and and live your life to the fullest and a lot of people today are are not doing that you know they're whatever the opposite of fullest is that's the way they're living their lives in order to prolong their life or or to reduce reduce risk and it's a really difficult balance that i think folks are struggling with today and i'm sure that with the direction that you guys are continuing to go, that it's a struggle for you as well. Oh, for sure. I mean, there's definitely times like that Arctic trip was a perfect example where, you know, you kind of have to take stock of where you are and what you're doing. I mean, when we arrived in the Arctic, it was 80 degrees we couldn't believe it. We took off our jackets. You know, we were prepared for a super cold weather. And when we got there, you know, we were in t-shirts. And then a few days later, the wind switched and started blowing from the north. And it went from just being, you know, this nice sunny weather that you'd experience in the lower 48 to 30 degrees snowing you know, blowing 40 miles per hour consistently and just miserable, miserable conditions. And that's when you kind of realize, man, if something went wrong, we're a long ways away from anything. And temperatures are real bad. Weather's crazy. You know, it, things, things can go bad real quick in a situation like that. But at the same time, as you were saying, for us, those are the moments when we feel alive. You know, that's what makes us feel like, man, we're really living here. Totally. Especially like when you're emotional, like after days of getting beat down, you know, it's like that when you get caught in storms or whatever, where you just have to be in your tent and you just get beat down by life and you think about a lot of stuff. Those are the times when it's easy to be like, you know, this is really not worth it. I, we probably shouldn't be here. We, this is dumb, you know, like whatever it's, it's easy to like allow yourself to have negative thoughts come in. But if, uh, at at the same time, you got to check yourself and be like, no, dude, this is what we live for. I mean, we take a lot of safety precautions and we're, we're really, we're really safe when, when we do go out, but there are things that happen um, that are beyond us. And uh, you just kind of have to roll with the punches and be ready for those types of things. And, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that's, that's 
what living is all about, man. It's just taking challenges and making yourself feel uncomfortable for for a little bit, just to to give yourself a little a reality check. Have you seen bad weather any other place? I mean, I know the weather in in like Iceland tends to be really consistent and good and nice, nice calm conditions. <laughs> Oh, oh. We have a... <laughs> no, uh, yeah, no. What Iceland is basically a tropical paradise. <laughs> I heard that was actually n- n- number two in the running when they're trying to name Iceland. Um, mm-hmm. the, the second one was tropical paradise, <laughs> <laughs> it would have been very fitting. <laughs> I think Court and I got a false sense of what Iceland really is. When the first time we went to Iceland, it really was beautiful. There was almost no wind and it was so nice. And we just thought, wow, this is not at all what we expected. So we've been back twice since and both times, I mean, they had closed roads down because of wind. One of the times they, on one road, that we were traveling back and forth on uh, to our fishing spot and then back to the hotel, 18 cars, including a big semi truck blew off the road and there were winds of over a hundred miles per hour. And Court and I, for some reason in our minds thought that we could still fish. (laughs) (laughs) We, we didn't drive though. So that's good. Yeah. We were fishing. Yeah. yeah. So if the wind is so strong that it's not safe to operate a vehicle, what, what weight rods were you throwing? Eight. <laughs> eight weights. So how much does an eight, how much does an eight weight line weigh? Oh, uh, what is it? 280 grains, I think. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Or more. Yeah. We, so not as much as a car. We'll, no. we'll say. <laughs> so what's it like to try and cast into 100 mile an hour winds if we had like if we had weights like like drop weights that were like eight ounces i still don't even think and you had like a spinning rod with like no air wind resistance i still don't even <laughs> think you could cast it out there dude <laughs> we were in like the best place in the whole world like to catch brown trout it's where we caught so many for our one film like so many fish in this one spot and derek and i were so stoked that we had this because we only had it for like two hours when we were fishing last time we had it for the whole entire day and we're like dude we are gonna catch like a hundred fish probably all over 28 inches and knowing that the those fish were just inches away from where we could cast to which is about three feet or three inches. <laughs> it was heartbreaking because the waves were coming in so big that we couldn't even like let the current take it out. The waves would just crash and we were just like, just shaking our head. It was so, so sad. Yeah. There was a river mouth that dumped in right there and the fish sit in the river mouth. And so here we are trying to drift nymphs and things in with the current. And literally it was blowing lake water back into the river and our indicators were moving upstream. (laughs) Yeah. But you guys got out there and fished anyways. And that's one of the things that really separates you from, from mere mortal anglers is that you go no matter what. And I remember when we were fishing in, in Argentina together, court was on a bit of a dry spell um (laughs) as in hadn't hadn't caught a fish yet (laughs) and uh and and that was really hard but i remember after a few days of that um (laughs) you know one of us asked court what his plan was and He just smiled a little bit and said, I think I'm going to go out on the porch and hang myself with my fly line. (laughs) But you didn't. You strung up your rod and you went down to the creek and you caught a dang fish because you persevered. And it only took him 12 days. (laughs) (laughs) That that was tough fishing. Um, But if you're 
if you're going to catch a special fish, you have to go through special circumstances. You know, guiding was shut down for most of the year. It's it's finally starting to open up here in Oregon. Um, and like one of the last obstacles was that they weren't offering any first aid CPR classes, which is a requirement for a guide license. So finally going to be able to start guiding here soon. Um, but it allowed me to fish, you know, just with family and friends and on my own for all the spring. And I fished in some really bad weather that I would never take anybody else out in. And, you know, as I was doing that, I would watch all the other boats leave and then I'd, I'd be out there all alone. And there was a bunch of times that I caught some really terrific fish and high numbers of fish. And it kind of helped me remember what I initially learned from you is that if you are willing to endure what no one else will, then you'll catch fish that nobody else can. And I think think if I were to boil down your success, it, it's basically that you're willing to endure what nobody else is willing to endure. It's the same thing with hunting. Like if you let stuff get you down, I mean, there, are, there are a lot of years where people will go out and they won't shoot anything, you know, like they'll hunt a solid 30 days or 15 days and you don't shoot anything. And if you let that get yourself down, then you won't be successful. You have to just keep going, keep going. And I need a good partner to be able to do that. And I think the best piece of gear you can have is a hunting buddy. And, you know, the guy that I hunt the most with, he and I are very, very similar in, in most ways. But what really makes us function is that when one of us starts to go down, the other one picks up, right? Right. And you guys do that yeah. for each other all the time, you know, and there's days when, you know, Derek is out there in his American flag yoga pants and, <laughs> and, <laughs> and court's not feeling too hot because, you know, the fish aren't doing it for him. And then uh, some days it, it flips around and, uh, you know, Derek's not feeling great and, and court, you're there to, to pick him up and be encouraging. And, and I think that is another really important dynamic for finding success in tough environments. Would you agree? Absolutely. I mean, I can, yeah, I can give dozens and dozens of experiences where I've had something happened and I've felt so down in the dumps while we're fishing, you know, breaking off the fish of a lifetime or whatever. And just thinking I just blew my shot. I might not ever see a fish like that again. And court just going, no, dude, it's good. Like, let's just keep going. Let's keep pushing. You know, we're fools and we're going to push through any kind of weather. And, you know, he just makes it fun. And then I get up and go, okay. And, you know, it might not be that day, but somewhere down the road on our trip, something else happens. And, you know, it's, it's a game changer. And really, if it were just me out there by myself, a lot of times I probably would have given up long before, but yeah to that fishing buddy or hunting buddy it definitely is a huge huge advantage to find somebody who can be upbeat in crappy conditions and bad weather and just you know through the thick of all all of it maintain a smile on their face and have fun with you classic example is when derek uh in our one film seriously north when it was like day 10 or something and we still hadn't caught really any fish or seen any and this it was snowing outside and the wind was blowing about 400 miles an hour and our tents were like laying down on the ground because they couldn't even stand up anymore and, and i like had had it dude like i hadn't slept forever hadn't caught fish or, we were eating like you know like mountain house meals that weren't even heated up we were just like crunching them and we were just like i just wanted to end it all at that time, which sounds like a common theme for about every trip that we go on. And Derek's just in the film. He's like, how are you feeling? Like just totally happy. And I look like I was dead. Like death had just come by, but that's, that's how Derek is. And it's totally true, dude. I don't, I don't pick anyone for my hunting or fishing partners that can't, 
be positive and upbeat and, you know, see the, the good in everything. I think that's a, a critical element to have in a, in a fishing buddy, in a bromance like that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how James is too. That's how you are. I mean, you were always, we weren't catching a ton of fish where we were with how the weather was, but you were just always, I mean, you're a lot mentally, a lot tougher mentally than I am. But yeah, I appreciate guys like that. Well, we're in such a beautiful place and, and just with great company. I mean, what, what more do you want? Like it was a tremendous adventure and, you know, whether you're turning up a bunch of fish or, or not, you know, it's, it's nice. And and we did, we did find some, some gigantic fish yeah. and it made those fish that much more special. You know, those Rabalo we were catching, those would have been a footnote if, if the sea run brown trout had been what we kind of expected them to be. But since they, since the trout weren't really participating, those Rabalo were awesome. They were cool. Yeah. And they're the only member of their, of their family, of their genus and species. See, to be able to appreciate that is awesome because you know, and that's why we that's why we like to fish with dudes like you because you can appreciate that. That's the only place that you can catch a fish like that on the fly in the whole entire world. And even if it was just that, I mean, I I would have been stoked. Yeah, me too. And uh, and then you know, being forced into a diet that was almost exclusively churros <laughs> that could have been worse. <laughs> <laughs> That was a fun trip. I mean, honestly, just for whatever reason, it maybe it's really weird, but when I look back at trips, it's always the ones that were hard, but that you made fun anyway, that are the most fun. Like I don't look back at a lot of the trips where I just hiked into a lake a couple miles and crushed fish all day long and think, wow, that was really the best day of fishing I've ever had. It's always the ones where there was some kind of adversity and you end up having fun anyway, despite, you know, whatever, five days of pouring rain or, you know, whatever it is. And then you look back on those trips and go, yeah, that was, that was the one. Totally. Yeah. And, you know, Zach and Lane, just awesome guys that we had on that trip with us very funny and and upbeat and positive and and enjoying the adventure and i'm i'm so grateful to lane for making all that happen um that that was just an experience that i never expected to ever have and and lane really made it happen but with with all of these experiences you know when you're starting out fly fishing in utah and not catching anything or you know you're heading over to the gallatin and um, trying to catch some of the most educated fish on the planet and wondering if you should be shadow casting or not. You know, you don't really expect that you're going to move on to a point where where you are getting to travel around the world and and see these these species and these places and and endure these challenges and end up on a freaking private jet to Alaska to fish, right? <laughs> like None of this is anticipated, but it is a product of determination and work. Definitely. Totally. Definitely. Totally. Tell me about Blackfin. We went from, from Blue Halo to Blackfin. How'd it happen? Hmm. Well, really, I think the end all be all is that Court and I saw an opportunity to just keep fishing together and having fun together but provide what we would consider a unique service. So a lot of people that get to go on these trips of a lifetime, you know, don't really have much to remember it by other than just a memory and maybe a photo or two. And so we started talking about a few of the problems with uh, fly fishing travel as it sits today. And two of the biggest things that we came up with was the documentation of the trip and the pre-trip education. You know, a, a guy 
saves up his money. He wants to go to Alaska. He books with the lodge. And then, you know, he's waiting a year or six months out to go on this trip. And he's pumped out of his mind, but he doesn't really know what to do or how to prep for the trip. You know, he doesn't, maybe he doesn't realize he's never fished bonefish before. And he doesn't realize that he needs to cast in the wind. And maybe he doesn't have to cast 70 feet, but he's got to cast 30 or 40 feet accurately into the wind. And so we started talking and said, <clears throat> you know, I think we can, can A, build the niche and give people a better uh, preparatory strategy to go on these trips where they have education available and they can look and see, and see like, okay, I'm going to this lodge and I need to know how to, you know, spay cast or I need to know how to double haul or Euro nymph or whatever that technique is. And our plan is to, to provide that education specific for each lodge. So the guy that goes on this trip of a lifetime can show up, he's prepared and he can really get the most out of his trip. And then on the trips that we go on as hosts, we're there to, you know, take some pictures and things so that later when a guy, you know, maybe catches that fish of a lifetime or whatever, hopefully we're there with him at the time and, and can take a picture of him that, you know, if he wants, he can get blown up to a poster size and put in his room. And every time he enters that room, he can look and go, man, that was the trip of a lifetime. That was the fish of a lifetime. And I've got this super sweet photo to remember it by. Well said. That's awesome. And I can't, I don't know. My, my memory isn't great. And I, I've talked, I've talked about this before, but if you have something to stimulate a memory, then that's really, really powerful. And no matter how good you think your memory is, it's, it's, it is distorted. And the way a lot of people access memories is, isn't that they're going back to uh, the memory of the actual incident. They're going back to the memory of the last time that they thought about it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's some loss each time. So the next time I think about Rabalo fishing in Tierra del Fuego, uh, the reality is I'm probably going to think about this conversation. So there's, there's a loss each time you access that memory. But if you have a video or if you have a photo, then it brings it all back in vivid color. And, and you guys are so tremendous at photography and, and videography that you're not going over the top with, with editing or, or anything crazy like that. You're just preserving the experience in the best possible way. And you've won a bunch of awards because of that. I know you're both humble guys, but tell people about some of the awards that you've won. Traditionally, we've made films for IF4, the International Fly Fishing Film Festival, which plays in a lot of different countries all over the world. And and we don't, you know, we don't really care about stuff like that, really. We just mostly want to make cool stuff and entertain people and and capture memories that we can keep forever. And so we never really go into a film project hoping that we're going to like win some sort of award or anything like that. And we are just a bunch of hacks, you know, we're just dudes that started recording that some of the adventures that we go on. And, and uh, so we don't really have a, a huge uh, background in film or anything like that. We just like to do it. So, so yeah, I mean, we're lucky that we've won, um, three consecutive years as uh, the film of the year, People's Choice Film of the Year with the International Fly Fishing Film Festival. And there's a lot of talented people out there for sure. So it's really cool to, to just get pushed and, and to try to think of different things that we can do and hit different species. And that's really a vehicle. It has been a vehicle for us to try to just go to places that we would never be able to go to otherwise. It's just kind of one of those things that we use to just 
travel the world and see different things and, and check off that bucket list of fish. Where can people see those films? Uh, most of them, I think, are on YouTube right now under Intense Media. How is Intense spelled? It's like you're in a tent. I N T E N T S. Intense Media. <laughs> And is it because that sometimes when you're filming, you're in tents? <laughs> Why, yes. <laughs> Most I of see. the time, <laughs> are in tents. And then sometimes it is intense. Correct. Yeah. This is like a, a pun, like a double entendre. Exactly. <laughs> okay, I'm being obnoxious about this so that people will remember intense media and can go look it up because... <laughs> These these films are really inspirational, aspirational. They're terrific. They're fun. And you'll see things that you don't know exist. I promise you. Like these Arctic char when they're colored up. I, you know, I'm a I'm a fish guy. This is part of my livelihood. I had no idea that that species could could color up like that in those sizes. Um, and I don't have what it takes to go out there and catch those fish. Um, maybe I do, but I don't want to. It's <laughs> it's cool for me to be able to to have the experience of of seeing them on a on a TV or a computer when uh, when I don't have to go through the agony <laughs> of getting beaten to death by the wind in the Arctic for you know, a week plus without ever seeing these things and dealing with all the doubt and uncertainty of just wondering, like, is this even going to happen? Do, do these unicorns yeah. exist? And to keep going out there and doing it. And it, folks, if you haven't fished for a week straight without seeing a fish, then you don't know despair. Like You, <laughs> you, you simply don't. Like, you just want to quit. You want to go out on the porch and hang yourself with your fly line. It's a horrible, horrible feeling. And to keep going past that and then achieve success takes the just takes a very special kind of person. And that's what you guys are. And that's what I appreciate about you. And that's what I appreciate about about your films that people can find at Intense Media on YouTube. James, I think it's important to know that, like, you know, a lot of people do watch just a lot of hunting and fishing shows and that's great. And it's awesome. You know, it's something that's great to do when you're just at home because that's what you love to do. But, but I don't think people see that in those films. They don't see that, dude, you were just doing the crappiest stuff ever of all time for a week. And you didn't even see anything because on film, they just see, Oh, they went to this place and then they caught this huge fish or whatever. And it was really cool. I think it's important for people to not get down on themselves and think that they suck at hunting or fishing and, and know that it's normal. It's not normal to just go out and just always catch a million fish or always shoot a, a big elk or a buck or whatever. It's just, it just doesn't happen. So I think it's important for people to like, Keep your spirits up. If you go, you know, three or four years without harvesting, then you just keep going. You learn from that experience and you keep, you just keep learning and growing and until you get to be like James when you shoot elk consistently every year. <laughs> that's just, I mean, that, that comes with work. It comes with a, with a lot of failure. You know, the foundation yeah. of success is a lot of doing it wrong. And some people get, you know, frankly, they get lucky and they experience success right off the bat. And then, you know, for whatever reason, they can continue doing that. Some people, some people never see that success again. But generally speaking, it is extremely difficult. The The things, the things that we're doing are, are very, very challenging. But if you're willing to keep going and keep learning keep researching, keep talking to people, then you can get to a point where that success comes a little bit easier um, or more reliably. But, you know, for me, I, I kind of find a sweet spot where I can be successful and then I remain there. You guys find a sweet spot where you're successful and you're like, how can we make this harder? 
<laughs> well, excuse me. There is a lot of truth to that. And maybe you were just sick, but I, I like what you said where success is built off of a lot of failure. And one day I was guiding and my client was getting really super frustrated and kind of threw a little bit of a fit you know, this stinks, fishing stinks, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I remember turning to the client and saying, you know, you're looking at the situation all wrong. If we were out here just catching fish after fish after fish, you really wouldn't be learning anything because I would just tie on a fly and you would catch the fish and that's that. And so this is the opportunity, you know, when we're failing that we can really learn something, you know, we can study the river a little bit more, see have the fish moved into a certain area, is there a certain bug that's coming off, and you and I can talk about it as a guide-client relation here and figure out a strategy, and you can learn from it. I said the same is true when you're out on your home water. If you just come to the water rigged up with a pheasant tail and you just go out and start slamming fish, you're never going to get better as an angler. But when you have to dig deep and really figure things out, you know, you're when you are failing, that's when you really learn. And I think for me, I'm totally in love with failure in that sense that if I have to dig deep and learn something new it pushes me to become a better angler and I don't need to have a repeated success time and time and time again. You know, sometimes I just like feeling like I stink at fishing because it forces me to get better. So I've, yeah, I, I like that. And I've waited until, you know, we're, we're getting towards the back end of this podcast. I've waited until now to ask this question on purpose because I want the people who have persevered through 49 minutes of listening to us talk <laughs> to be able to access this information, because those are the people who can act actually do something with it. So now I want to ask you guys, how do you plan for a big fly fishing trip? Like give, just give me 10 minutes of, you know, start to finish, like from, from the idea concept to getting there and getting home again. Um, how do you, how do you even do it? Because it is intimidating to think about trying to go to another country, another continent, someplace you've never been species you've never seen. Yeah. Take it. Court, why don't you jump in on the concepts, how we come up with a trip? Usually we, we've got a fish and it's, it, and our bucket lists are really pretty similar. Sometimes, you know, fish on our bucket lists are a little bit higher um, than others, but they're usually all kind of you know, they all are kind of there, but typically you just want to find, like for us, we want to find, we want to go to the place where is number one on our bucket list, like figure out how to make that happen. So once like, for example, uh, the Arctic char that we've been talking about, Arctic char were really, really high on, on everyone's list. And at the time it was basically the top of the list for pretty much everyone. And so, you know, and it all starts with a lot of, just a lot of research. Derek and Phil are really good at doing all the research and finding, you know, Phil talks and communicates with some of the other biologists up there. Derek digs into research papers and, and different scientific articles to figure out where they are and where their spawning grounds are and if there are fish actually in that spot. And, uh, and just basically trying to figure out where they are and if they're there, because this trip is super duper expensive to, to fly up there. I mean, it's, it's thousands and thousands of dollars to, to get up there and to maybe not see or catch fish is it's pretty risky, but yeah, that the general concept is to just find something you're passionate about and do as much possible research as you can to get there. And then Derek will tell you the rest. So, I, I, you know, going along with what Court said, after we've done our research, then we go through kind of a checklist of gear to figure out, you know, what do we really need 
to do this trip and do it safely. So for you know, multiple trips, we've had to go through a camping gear list, um, satellite phones, meals, clothing, I mean, everything to prepare for the worst possible situations because you never know, you know, you could be in Iceland and the weather is beautiful and things are looking great. And then all of a sudden, you know, the weather turns and that's happened to us in Iceland. It's happened to us in Alaska in the Arctic. I mean, all over the place. And so really being prepared for those you know, terrible, terrible weather days or emergency situations is key. And, you know, we take great care in going through and making sure that we have all the gear needed so that we can come home safely. And then secondary to that is, you know, once we've kind of tried to chart all the different possibilities of where these fish are going to be, you know, moving up from one place to another on their spawning migration or moving in to overwinter into a system or whatever. And we feel we have the, the movement at least kind of dialed in. Then we will, you know, typically figure out a situation where we can move, uh, be that hiking or rafts or whatever, and then we contact as many local sources as we can about finding the right flies to make sure that we can actually catch fish. And sometimes what we think is going to catch fish is doesn't work at all. And sometimes the last weird random thing that you have in your box is what ends up catching fish. And, you know, Iceland was a perfect example of that. We were fishing. We were doing okay. We were catching some fish, but... I end up tying on a wire worm just to try it out and caught a whole bunch of really big brown trout in Iceland on a wire worm. And the guy looked at me like I was crazy when I tied it on, but it worked out. I think uh, Derek might've dropped off for a second. So where do you even, where do you even access I was just that checking my computer too. <laughs> um, so like for us, um, we found some scientific articles that that show uh, that they were uh, they were done so long ago that showed a couple different places where the fish had spawned, you know, where their spawning grounds are, where um, someone in the past has done some research to to try to preserve these fish that they're you know or have low numbers. And so online, Google's like your best friend. A lot of times we will, uh, we actually even found some um, videos on YouTube that were of this particular area or, or, or pretty close to it. And, uh, and so that kind of put a couple of the pieces together in the puzzle for us to, to be like, okay, if we go at this time, this is, you know, before they spawn, but these are river run fish or sea run fish. So they should be in that system if they're there at that time. But, you know, we walked in that, on that trip, we walked over a hundred miles, like 110 miles, just looking through the water. We were floating through the water. We were, we had drones up trying to just see stuff, see stuff on the horizon. And we never, you know, we didn't see a fish forever. And so the whole time we're thinking, okay, we just spend like 15 grand on, a trip and we're not even going to like see a fish. And so we thought we'd done everything right, but it wasn't coming together. But yeah, you got to do your, you just have to do your research. You've got to, the internet's your best friend and calling different, different people. Like, like a lot of biologists have certain areas that they're in charge of in a, in a particular state or country or whatever. And most people don't know that you can call those guys up and just talk to them and say, Hey, we're coming up on this trip and, uh, we really want to go do this, but we don't know where to go. Can you help us? Can you help point us in the right direction? And most guys, most guys will just tell you straight up like what they know. And that's awesome. And that's critical for finding stuff. 
when I talk with biologists, I try to ask very specific questions instead of sort of, uh, you know, vague how to. So if you go to a biologist and say, hey, man, where are the where are the big bull elk at? He's probably going to be like, uh, I don't know, in those mountains. Um, <laughs> but if yep. you say, hey, I was looking at, you know, foggy bottom creek. And I wondered if there's water in there in October, then yeah. he'd be like, yeah, actually there is. And like, okay, that's interesting. What type of vegetation can I expect to see in there? Oh, well, you're going to find um, Doug fir and some huckleberry brush. Okay. Do you think the elk are still at that elevation that time of year? And now is, now is where you're starting to get into ac- actionable intelligence. And, you know, you're not just... You're not just pimping him for information. You're yep. interested in his knowledge, and now he's interested in in you and, and in sharing it with you. Totally. Um, so, what totally. would be some specific questions that you would ask a biologist about fish in a certain place? Um, similar to that, yeah, we would we would ask like because we did the same thing. You know, we said uh, there is there's this area that we're looking at. Um, have you have you guys has anyone been in there at all during this time? Um, if so, are there fish there? We found this, you know, this old paper that says that there was a study done and and they counted this many fish in there. Are those fish still there? I mean, this was done in the eighties asking, um, it's just like, kind of like you said, just more just being like their buddy and like chatting. Cause most guys like are in that position, love to talk about that kind of fish. You know, they don't have every day when someone emails them or something and says, Hey, uh, Arctic char are really cool. It's like my favorite fish in the whole world. I'd like to pick your brain on that stuff, you know? And they usually are just love to talk about that fish. Cause they're so passionate about, it, especially in the middle of nowhere. So we yeah. were able to get some information. Um, a lot of it was, uh, I don't know, I guess luck a little bit, but we did do just a lot of research to make it happen. And uh, it it eventually did. But yeah, we had to pers- persevere through a lot of days of just for crap for that. And what about logistics as far as like gear that you take? Are you bringing multiple rods? Do you What do you bring multiples of? Um you know, how do you select flies for, for a trip when you don't know what's going to be going on? Typically that's the, those are the questions that people ask. And that's sort of why we're doing this black fin thing is when people go on a trip, they want to know what flies to take. They want to know what rod sizes to take and what the weather is going to be like. For us, we know, you know, Arctic char are, um, they're a char species. So like lake trout, brook trout, um, bull trout, all these Arctic or all these char species, subspecies, we know kind of what they like to eat, where they like to hold, what they like to do. And uh, so we use that information to select flies and we just take kind of a big selection of of flies that we know like pinks at that time because they were just in the ocean. So pink's a great color, white's a great color. And then we you know, when we went, we actually did have a couple flies that were more successful than others, but we only had a couple of them. And so we had to, we had to kind of accommodate, you know, we were, we're tying flies and cutting off other flies and making kind of just making them work, even though we didn't have quite the right thing. Um, then the next time when we went up, the second time we went up, we had a better idea of what, what to do and what to use and what to tie up and stuff. So we were finding like they, those fish gator roll like crazy. So you hook them and they'll spin around like a, like a gator, like a billion times, (laughs) like like a death roll. And I don't even know how it's even possible, like what they do with their fins to do that. But they would just pop you off and they were just like, they were just geniuses at getting away. So, but it was not an option. You know, if you only hook one or two of these fish in, a 10 to 14 day trip, you got to make it stick. So, so we figured out a way that, you know, we had a trailer hook that was pointed upward and then the other hook was pointed downward. And, 
and we were doing just all this other stuff to try to figure out how to make them stick a little bit better. And that's, you know, it's, you just kind of just have to do a lot of research, especially if it's going to be a trip of a life, a lifetime where you're going to a different country, you have to figure out, you know, what, um, you know, customs and things like that. Like right now we're supposed to be in Bolivia and, uh, that's not happening, you know, cause of COVID, but, but it was just, it's a remote trip where you're just down there with, you know, like native guys and, and you need to know their cultures and, and what is acceptable and what's not acceptable. But yeah, um, forums are a really good way to, to get that out or talking to people that have already made the trip. Cause it's likely, you know, if you're going almost anywhere in the world, it's really likely that somebody's already been there. And if somebody's already been there, they're probably going to be pretty stoked to talk about it to you. So don't be afraid to, if you've seen someone go on a trip and to reach out to them and befriend them and, and not just try to get info because people don't really like that, but hang out, talk to them, ask them questions. All those, all those things, you know, will, will help you in your journey to, to be more successful. So if I were planning a trip like this, my move would be to get a hold of you guys and talk with Blackfin Fly Fishing and be like, hey, I'm planning this trip and I need your help because this is a big deal to me. This is a trip that I'll probably only get to do once and I want to do it right. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Unfor- unfortunately, um, Derek's internet up there in Big Fork, Montana, I dropped him off. Um, so he's not going to be able to conclude the podcast with us. But Court, um, I really appreciate your time and, and getting on here. How do people get a hold of you guys if if they're interested in Blackfin, if they have questions, if they just want to follow along on on these incredible adventures that you go on? You can go to our website at blackfinfishingco.com. Kind of confusing. Um, or you can find me <clears throat> at Blue Halo Gear dot com on Instagram or wherever. But our email and stuff, our contact information should be on our website. And uh maybe we can put some links or something somewhere to for people to go check out some of the films if they want. We don't have all of them on there, but we've got enough to make people happy, I guess. Yeah. So I'll I'll definitely have some links to uh some of your videos and to Blackfin in the show notes. So you can click on those if you want to learn more. And I really encourage people to because uh, Derek and Core are are fantastic guys and you just are not going to find their type of knowledge and experience and and verve for fly fishing uh, anywhere else. I'm sorry <laughs> that Derek dropped off, but yeah, once again, Court, thank you. And uh, we'll talk with you again soon. Best of luck in, uh, in your future travels and, and tight lines. Thanks, James. We super appreciate your time and letting us come on and, and uh, we're happy to do it. Thanks a bunch for having us. Alrighty, folks. Hope you enjoyed the show. Today's episode was edited by Emily Brannigan. The music was from Justin Hay and the art is from Celia Christofferson and John Chatelain appreciate all these folks and i appreciate you guys for listening if you enjoyed the show i encourage you to share it with a friend and subscribe catch you next time